But it doesn't say you're not supposed to receive. You will receive when it comes to God. Can I get amen? amen. Praise the Lord. I want us to be a giving church. I want us to be a loving church, a surrendering church. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you open up your Bibles, we're going to move on with the service. You have to sing happy birthday to pastor first. Oh, Lord, I try to get by. Oh. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday. Raise the roof. You don't want me to testify. You don't want that. I testify every time I preach. So <laughs> there's always a little testimony in my in my preaching. So I'm not going to testify. But the reason why they they're, they're saying that is because every year you get a chance to testify uh, on your birthday to see if you know you want to just tell God or tell the church exactly how God has been good to you. Um, I, I talk about that all the time, and I'm going to talk about it probably some tonight. Uh, so we'll move on. If you open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 22 and 21, we're going to continue on. I was, I was, I've got more to preach on when it comes to life and death, but because it was Father's Day, I had to go on, and, and I didn't, I felt like I needed to stop where I did. I couldn't continue the sermon, but I had a lot of things left to preach. So fortunately, I get to continue that today. We're going to be talking on the topic of being fatherless. Being fatherless. Now, just to give you a quick review, we talked about what happens when you are someone who doesn't obey God and you obey the, the earthly father but not your heavenly father, then you can't live. It says that you should obey the heavenly father as you do your father, uh, for those that do, and you will live. It talked about what it's like to be fatherless uh, in terms of being illegitimate. And we do, listen, I'll tell you what, I felt a whole bunch of legitimate children of God in this place today. I felt legitimacy. It was people who are living, are seeking, or, or, or God's touching in this place. No question, God was doing a work in this place today. But there are so many, some in here and some out there, that are, are, are illegitimate because they're fatherless. Because they don't have the, 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 what they need to have in God, and we're going to talk about that. I'm not swearing right now, but the, the word was used in the word of God as being a bastard or not having a, a not being of the legal uh, uh, con connection with God. We are to be married to God. That's what it's always often talked about, a marriage with God. And there is some responsibility when you get married, Richard and Valia. Since you're the newest newlyweds in the church, we'll pick on you. There's some responsibility. You know, when he first got married, already he was asking permission. Okay, what candy bar do I get, babe? Is this one okay? Because he doesn't have the ability to just pick by himself anymore. Uh, I used to be a man, and then I got married. I lost all my rights. I lost all my choices. You got to run everything through to the lake. Because if you don't, brother, look out. Try to make a decision on your own. Is that your wife, Robert? Uh, he knows. That's why he, mm. he knows. You lose that. I was telling one guy who's single, enjoy it. He's look. I want a wife. I was like, that's good. Wives are great, but enjoy it while you're single. It's gonna change. There's an idea of a marriage, and when there's a marriage, there's responsibility. There's commitment. There, there is a God-centered life that's required of you. And if you don't, then you're fatherless. You're 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 not a legitimate. Uh, relationship with God and there's so many illegitimate relations with God. Let me give you one where someone says, I'm a Christian but I sin every day. Drives me crazy. Because if you are a Christian and you are sinning every day, then that's something that can be fixed. You know what it's called? Repentance. I'm going to repent of my sin. If sin shows up in my life, I'm going to get rid of it. How do we do that? We get close to God. We get so close to God that we don't even want it. We want nothing to do with it. We keep in our minds, every, every thought comes into captivity. I know where that sin's going to take me. And I'm unwilling to go in that direction. That's why these pews are not full. Well, part of the reason, some of the reasons some of the people haven't been witnessing like you used to. 
including myself. I'm going to bust some cards when I leave here. You know, it happens to all of us. We get into a place where we get comfortable. Uh, I still talk to a lot of people, but I need to, to talk to more. And, and I encourage the church to talk to more. But the reason why these pews are also empty is because we don't teach a nice, comfortable, cozy message that just makes everybody feel happy. If people are coming in broken, they're not happy and for good reason. It's because they're full of brokenness and sin. And what they need is revival. They need to be revived. And Sister Paul, I love Sister Paul. She says, and, and, and please, if you're Native American, please don't get all upset. I got some Native in me too, so y'all can't get mad at me. I'm a weech old tribe uh, from, from, from over there by the Yucatan. Uh, you got to understand, she said, people go on all these revivals all summer long. Uh, she goes, how many revivals they need before they get revived? How about you come to one service as a 16-year-old girl and get yourself in the presence of God the way he asks and get full of his spirit. Look, at she can't stop smiling now. She's all, she's just full of the Holy Ghost. She, that's, that's what revival is. When people become full of God's spirit, they become revived. You don't got to keep going to revivals for that. You just got to go to a church that's going to teach you to get rid of your sin and fight with all you have to be close to God. Mm, Exodus 22 and 21. I'm having too much fun. Thou shalt neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for ye were strangers in the land of Israel, in Egypt. So the Israelites are being told, don't you uh, oppress people like you were oppressed. Verse 22, ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry unto me, I will hear their cry, and my wrath, my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Let's pray. Whew, Jesus, my God. Let us be a people who will learn from history. Let us be a people who will become wiser than those that have come before us. Let us be a people who want to be so close to you that we'll be willing to come to near death to be in your presence. Because we can't be face to face with God, but boy, we can try and strive and drive to be as close as humanly possible. In Jesus' name, and the church said amen. Let's clap unto the Lord one more time. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We're talking about the Father. Now, as I talk about the Father in this situation, I want you, this is Old Testament, but there is, whenever there's an Old Testament concept, there's generally a New Testament reflection of the Old Testament understanding. And so, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the concept of fatherless. In this text, it's talking about someone who specifically or li uh, literally don't have a father. Just like the widows don't have a husband. Man, I'm gonna, the Lord just took me in two different directions. Because we just talked about uh, being recognized as the bride. As a bride. And what happens? Uh, you have the bride and the groom. It's a marriage. And if one dies or one's not there, you don't have that anymore. So we're talking about the loss. The fatherless is not having a father. That's what they're talking about. The Old Testament concept is the woman loses her husband and the man loses or the person loses their father. They're literally fatherless. What I want to do is take you into the, the present, into the New Testament concept of what it's like for us to spiritually not have a father. Because it's, there's similarities to the physical and the spiritual. But I'm here to tell you that I, when, when the Lord was showing me this, it, He was showing me the reflection of today being fatherless, not without a, a, a biological father or a legitimate father, but not having God the Father in your life. And when I say God the Father, I'm talking about the one God. His name is Jesus. He is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He is all three in one. You know, I'm not going to argue those. You know, I, I like to agree with people. I agree that there are three representations of God, and they're all one. How many gods do we serve? One God. Even the devils know that, okay? So, there is just one God, and to not have God means that you are fatherless because Jesus is the father. If you don't have Jesus, then you are fatherless because Jesus said, well, me and the, I and the father are one. What did he say to Philip? Somebody, you know how I love to do this. Who, what, did, what did Philip say to Jesus? 
No, that was Jesus. What did Philip say to Jesus? Show us the Father. What did Jesus say? What's the key word? I. Jesus said, have I been with you so long? I love preaching that. It's fun to say that. So long. Hello. If you don't have Jesus, then you are fatherless. And so, I want to make that transition. But in this scripture, it's talking about the idea of the Israelites being willing to oppress other people. Don't you do it. Because you've been oppressed. There are some people in this room right now who have been hurt by others. But then we become willing to hurt someone else. If we have been hurt, if, we have, if, that, if that thing has happened to us, why are we doing it to someone else? If someone has come against you and it brought you so much hurt and so much pain, why would you do that to someone else? We need to look at our behavior so that we can get rid of anything that would take the church out of revival. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep making this, this New Testament reference to this Old Testament concept of being fatherless. Now, they were told that if they were to oppress the fatherless, that they would be killed. Well, let's look at that in the New Testament. Who are the, fa who are the fatherless today? What do we call them? Starts with an L or an S. Sinners. Now, I, I like to say the lost better because, you know, sinners sounds so condescending. You're just a bunch of dirty, rotten sinners. Um, you know, and, and, and the people in the church have found themselves struggling with sin from time to time if they're in the right church. Just because you get yourself free from sin doesn't mean you'll never sin again. But when you do find yourself having something come upon you that's sin, you've got to get rid of it quickly. Because it'll always what? It'll always increase. It'll always get bigger. It'll always grow. So if sin ever comes in your life, you've got to get rid of it. But we're talking about the idea of having a, 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 a community around us and they're full of people who are lost. Right? Now if they're already lost, that means they're fatherless. If we make a New Testament concept of what we're talking about here, you are not to oppress the people who are already lost. Uh, let me ask you a question. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Have anybody, before anybody was saved, what were they? They were lost. They were sinners. So you've already been in captivity. Somebody hear me. What was he telling them? You were in Egypt. You were bound and you were oppressed. Don't oppress other people. Well, guess what? We were lost. We were sinners and we were needing God. And now we're in church. You better not oppress the lost. Mm. That's fun. I love when God talks to me like this. This is so much fun. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't bring God to a sinner, then that's something that's bad. That's wrong. That's dangerous. You know what you're, you know what you're doing? You're aiding. Come on, this is so much fun. If you don't pick up cards and talk to people about coming into the concept of getting a relationship with God the way he said, and you don't aid in that, you're oppressing them. You're aiding to their oppression because you're not giving them what they need to get free. And what happens to those that oppress the fatherless. What does he say he's going to do? He's going to kill them. What he, and I see you can say, well, wait a minute, Pat. Now you're taking it too far because I'm a Christian. And I, uh, just because I don't maybe go to enough people and witness, you're going to say that I could be lost? What about the parable of the talents? What were they called? They were called servants and they had talents. Talents was actually money. It wasn't, you know, being able to... That's not the talents that we're talking about. It's talking about money. Okay. And so they, one had a certain amount of talents. And they didn't increase. Or I'm sorry. There was three. One had one. One had five. One had ten. The one that had five and ten, they increased. And they were considered what? In the parable. Servants. To the master. And they were required to increase. And what happened to the one that did not increase? It was a servant. What happened when he didn't increase? It was, he was told that he was cast into the lake of fire where there's gnashing and teeth and wailing. The only place that I know that is described to that is hell. So he was a servant and he did not increase, which means to increase. He buried his. He just held. He was too afraid. Well, I knew that you were a hard man and I better not. Oh, I, I better just make sure I just give you what you asked. He knew that he was supposed to increase. If you go to this church, you know you're supposed to reach out to the lost. 
You know what? I want to have revival. The, oh, the best way to have revival is to have people like Devana come into a church for the first time, feel the power of God, and get the Holy Ghost. That's what brings revival. You want to have revival? Then we got to bring people into the church and watch their lives change. Every one of you in here who is in here now, we used to, we started with very few people. It was just me and my wife and a couple others. And, and, and now we're more because we went out and reached people and we're having revival. Every one of you was part of the revival for the last four years. We just celebrated our four year anniversary last weekend. That's how we've done it. We've had people get baptized and get the Holy Ghost every month for four years. And it's not changing because it's May, or sorry, it's June, and we've already had people get baptized. Now we got someone to get the Holy Ghost. That's revival. It carries on and it carries on. Why? Because people are bringing people to church. And whenever pe people come to church, their lives begin to change. Now, do people go back out? Yes. You're never going to have 100% uh, people come in and stay in. Never. God said that. That's, that's not biblical to say, oh, well, you're not doing well because people left. People are always going to leave. There is a war going on. You will never have a war without casualties. You'll always have casualties, and there's been casualties in this war. Listen, there is a whole world of, let's just stick to Gallup, there is a whole community of fatherless people. We talked on Sunday, Robert, uh, this was a really cool thing, so I'm going to repeat it. We talked about having starving men, men who are starving for love. I mean, look at all, this is not a new thing where we've, people have grown up without fathers. This has been going on for a long time. And so we've got all these men now who've been growing up who never had a guy who, in their life, whether it be even an uncle or a father, give them a hug and say, oh, I love you and give them a noogie. That's all I wanted when I was growing up. All I wanted was for, for, for my dad to just, to have a dad, to, to, oh, I love you and just give me a hug. You know what I do to my son all the time? I just hug him. Oh, I just love you. But a dollar for every time I kiss my son, I'd be rich. Or my sons. Now, there's people starving for love. And, it's, and, there's, and there's too much homophobia going around where you can't love anybody. Uh, if you're a guy, you can't tell someone you love them because then you're gay or something. And, and I'm not questioning gay people or not gay people because that's not what I'm here for. But, but that's the stigma where, oh, you can't do that or somehow it's feminine. Or, no, no, no. We need love too. And that, that's such a big thing that people are not getting in today's society. Why do you think our society is so twisted? Because there, there's so many men who never got love, who needed love just as much as women need love. Oh, so you're not hearing me. <laughs> you're not hearing. This is, this is real. Let me tell you something. Why, one of the reasons why I became a drug addict, and that's my testimony, was because I had three fathers and none of them could get the job done right. I had an adopted father, a stepfather, and a biological father who I've never even met. Now fortunately now that I got into the church, I have a much better relationship with my stepfather who's been there since I was five. I didn't call him dad until I was 31. Call him Dale. That was his name because he's some white guy who I don't even identify with. I don't even know who are you and what are you doing with my mother? <laughs> you know what I'm about to say. <laughs> How did it go? Keep your hands off my mama and keep your hands off my Doritos. <laughs> I don't even, I don't identify with you at all. And he was kind of a quiet guy so he didn't give her. How are you doing John Michael? I'm like, how are you doing? I didn't want this. I wanted a hug and I wanted love. We need that just as much. And that's why we got so many crazy men out there who are doing all kinds of crazy things. And, and, I, and I want to fix that in the church. We need to be able to say, I love you, brother. And it not have to be a, a, something that's uncomfortable. Uh, brother Robert, didn't I ask you today before, because I don't want to know you. Didn't I say, I'm a hugger. Can I give you a hug? Didn't I say that? You know why? Because you can't do that with every guy. Hey, 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 brother, what's up with that? Come on now, ease, hold on. So I have, I understand that, so I have respect and I ask people, but I think that should be, with, that's how I express, I love people. Hey, let me give you a hug, man, what's up? You know, so, you know, because guys have to be cool, you know, they got to give the hug and, you know, tap on the back so they don't feel too, you know, it's funny. It's all right to give someone else a hug. So men need love too. It talks about not to vex a stranger. Let's talk about what vex is. To oppress, to suppress, to treat with violence, to mistreat, to do wrong unto them, to treat violently or to maltreat. We don't need to be doing that to sinners. And if we don't need to be doing that to sinners, we certainly don't need to be doing that in the church. Can I get amen? This is the mindset of God in the scripture that I gave you in, in, in Exodus. The man disobeys God. 
because he was told not to vex the stranger. This, of, then the, the man becomes, uh, this, this disobedience to God afflicts the fatherless because they are attacked by these people. And then the person becomes fatherless as a result. You, the person who was afflicting those, become fathers because they lose relationship with God. You know, this, this is a sad and scary idea that people, and that there's lots of people who think that you cannot lose your relationship with God. Now, I didn't say you lose love. God doesn't stop loving the church, but you can lose relationship with him. You know, this very, it's very much like a, a human relationship. When you do something wrong to someone enough, they come to the point, no matter how much they love you, eventually they would say, enough is enough. And they put their arm out and say, I need to put you away. Doesn't mean they stop loving the person, but it's the behavior or it's the betrayal or it's the wrongdoing over and over again. And often which brings pain to that person. Come on, this is God. You, you think God feels good about our sin? What does it say in the scripture when you sin? It is like you are crucifying him anew. Anybody watch Passion of the Christ? Did you see what went on? Did you fall? Come on, somebody. If you didn't cry, I mean, I'm going to question your heart. Oh. So if you've seen that in any movie, any, even if you've read it and you see what happened to him, and if you realize when you sin, you crucify him anew, that means that you're beating him again. You're doing the same thing that they did to him when you continue your sin. So you think it doesn't hurt God? When we betray him after all he's done for us? You don't think that after you do that enough, he says, I love you, but I got to let you go? What did it say that the apostles did? They turned them over to Satan that they might be saved. You go and get so beat up by the devil that you will finally repent. Mm, come on, this is, this is beautiful. This is good. See, people struggle with these kind of things, but they're biblical. Then his children become fathers because God kills the man. This is what I was talking about in Exodus. The children become fathers because God kills the man. I, already, I was going to talk about my father. I've already told you I've had three fathers. And it was very difficult to connect with them. But until, and let me finish that story. Until, you know, I was hurting. I was doing drugs. I was drinking. You know what I used to do when I, I've told the church before, but some of you guys haven't heard. When I used to get real high on cocaine, I used to write my dad's letters. Because I would get the courage to speak from my heart because I was high. and It would kind of all come out. And, and I'd start to write how I really feel. And then when I got clean, or not clean, but when I got sober the next morning, I'd rip it up. Because I no longer had the courage to send it. That's where I was in my life with this father. But when I met... Jesus Christ, who is my Father, He fulfilled every portion of what I needed in a daddy. And I was completely fulfilled and healed of any harm or hurt that came from not having a father. You know why? Because at that moment, I stopped being fatherless. I finally knew what it was to have a daddy who would give me that hug and that love when I needed it most, would give me that nugget. I mean, it wasn't the same physical connection, but spiritually, I got everything that I needed from God and from the Word of God. You better read your Bibles. Some of us in here are hurting, and we, we, we want to touch from God, we want a word from God, but we won't crack the book. I used to always, when I would preach, I used to always tell people, oh, you want to hear from God, liar? I was, a higher, I was a harder preacher back then. You want to hear from God? Really? Liar? See, I can do it now as a joke because I'm not being serious. But that's what I used to say. You know why you say that? Oh, you want to hear from God, but you won't read your Bible. Because if you open your Bible, God will speak to you directly. It is his word. It comes from him. He wrote it through a man called the Apostles. And the Bible says itself that the word was not written by man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, you know, oh, my dad loves it. Oh, man wrote the Bible, so it's fallible. Well, then you don't understand the Spirit. Because the Spirit's not fallible. And that's what guided every movement of the hand of the man that wrote that, that word. Praise God. 
I'm almost, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I definitely got to quit. I'm going to end with this one. I still didn't get to the place where I wanted to be, but that's okay. I'm still feeling, I like to end on positive notes, and my last couple scriptures are positive notes, but I think today has been positive. I think the Lord has positively showed that he was here. I'm positive that somebody got the Holy Ghost. I'm positive that we feel good about what God was doing in this place. I'm positive God moved and touched the church, touched our flesh. I'm positive God did some healing in this place. I'm positive. It was a, it was a very positive message. Praise God. I'm going to end with this. James 1 and 21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and slew. I love this part. Superfluity of naughtiness. That's pretty bad. That's where it just, not, where just, your sin just flows. It just comes out. It is superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness. By the way, I'm guessing about the superfluity. I'd have to look up the Greek and Hebrew. Or in this one would be the Greek. Uh, but I have it, but it sounds good. And receive with meekness the engrafted words which is able to save your souls. I love when I preach the message before I get to it. I just talked about that word that, that's going to save, the engrafted word. That's what's going to save your soul. Uh, verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You got to be doers of the word, but in order to know what to do, you got to read it. And in order to know what to do, at least be at the house of God. If you're not reading your Bibles, at least come to the house so I can preach you the Bible. Some of us, that's the only word we hear is when I preach it. But it says, if you'll be a hearer, which means you got to be here to hear it, then you can be a doer. Don't just be a hearer only. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he behold himself and go with his way and straightway forget us what manner of what he was or what manner of man he was. If we just hear it, and don't do it. We come to see ourselves the way we should. It's so funny. When people come to God, I watch the light turn on. And it, it's like a man looking in the mirror. He can see himself. When we come to God, we see ourselves for who we really are. And what we're really doing because the word exposes. The light shines on our darkness. And we go, there I am. I have never, I'm telling you right now, I have never had the Lord speak to me about this scripture where I'm telling you right now. Not even when I was studying it. That's how, how I love God works. You look at yourself and, you, and the, the light turns on and you can see who you are. You can see what you're doing wrong. You can see what you're supposed to do right. And then we walk away from the mirror and we don't see, oh come on somebody. We walk away from the mirror and we don't see ourselves anymore. Because we're not in the mirror anymore. But what we need to do, church, is we need to be in the mirror. We need to be in the church, seeing ourselves who we are, and then take it out with us. And as we go home, we need to remember, not to forget the man that we were when we were looking in, in the face of God. And God's showing us through His Spirit, through His Word, what needs. Man, we hear it, and we go home, and we forget it. We don't do it. We don't do what we hear. And that makes us disobedient. And we wonder why we're not where we want to be spiritually. We wonder why we don't have the same maturity that we want to have. We look at someone else and go, well, I wish I had that. Well, then do what they're doing. And you can have what they have. We look at ourselves when we come to church. And, and God can show us exactly who we are. Don't walk away and forget. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I feel like that blessed man right now. I look at all the things in my life and I just feel blessed at every turn. And that doesn't mean everything's going per per perfect in my life because it's not. There are some real battles I got to come up against this year. But, but I'm faithful because I know I'm going to be blessed. And now being blessed does not always mean getting what you want. It means God taking care of you in any situation and being able to hold you up and hold you high. Be able to smile, hold your head up, knowing, hey, it may not be going the way I'd like it to go, but I know God knows what he's doing, so I'm going to be all right. God's got my back. Oh! I love that. I have a shirt that says, God's got my back. It says, uh, no weapons formed to get me shall prosper in the front. And on the back it says, God's got my back. It's on my back. I like that. The people look at it because they can read it. Yep, God's got his back. If any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. I've, I've just got to 
I've got two, two lines left. Just look, can I just preach for a second? I'm not going. I'm not going to take too much time. But I just got to tell you about this scripture. I had a guy tell me he just came out of church. We're working in my paintball field, and he is dropping f bombs, and he is dropping all kinds of curse words. And he, I guess, he was old British uh, uh, military. And and yeah, yeah, I went about the other day. He's a British guy. I'm doing, doing my best. And, and then, but he's adding these words. And I'm like, bro, wait a minute. You know I'm a pastor, right? You do. Okay. Why? You say you went to church yesterday, but you feel okay dropping these words? Please explain that to me. Oh, well, that's just how I talk, Mike. I'm like, okay, well, I don't understand it, but could you just kind of hold back while you're talking to me? Just, you know, a little bit? He did pretty good after that, but I mean, he'd still slip because it was so, you know, that's religion. Because he, he was, I bet you, listen, if he could go into the house of God and be talking like that, that's a problem, right? So if he's okay to be talking like that outside the house of God, then it tells you what his relationship is inside the house of God. Because I promise you, he's not doing it in there, which means he knows it's wrong. And he's willing to do it outside of there, which means he doesn't have that relationship. He's illegitimate. He's actually fatherless. To be able, and, and it doesn't just go with that behavior. There's always other behaviors that, that, that come together with those things because you can begin to see a person's walk. I'm not interested in religion. I may be a religious person, but I'm religious in my behaviors towards the Bible. I'm not interested in religion. There are people who are very religious about their sin. Oh, come on. That's fun. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're very religious. They do it every week. They have the same drink. They have the same drug. They spend the same amount of money or they'll take all their money. There are very people who are religious about gambling. They go to the same casino. They go to the same machine. They won't leave that machine. And you try to touch them. No, I'm not a gambler. I'm, I'm just saying. I've seen this. I've heard about it. Try to touch their machine after they leave. They put things on the machine and mark this is mine. I put $500 in this machine and I intend to get my $500 back. Don't you touch my machine. You watch it, old granny pick up a purse. Get to swinging. You don't mess with people's machine. They're religious. There's people who are religious about a lot of things. Satanic people are religious about Satan. I'm not interested in religion. I'm interested in obedience to God because that's how I get a relationship with him through my obedience you know what I almost said is I'm interested in relationship but there's something more important than that because